everybody, and welcome to Paranormal Nation Radio, Not So Normal. Denise and Ron, how are you doing tonight in Florida? Good. How's it going up there? Nice and cool. Nice and cool, huh? 60, degree, 60 for the high today. So. 90-something, man. We think we got our guests. Hey, Nigel. Yeah, we do. Hello, Gary. And thank you for sharing, Nigel. Nigel, we appreciate it. Yes, Nigel, we do. Yeah, like I said. And our cats are coming over to invade. Like I said, when we were off the air. It I, looked like a stick figure. I'm like, oh, no, that's just the lines on the shirt. Oh, I thought. <laughs> I thought SLS was on. <laughs> hey, Tom. I've got hey, Mom. A migraine, so I may not stay here this whole time. But okay. I at least wanted to come and be on for as long as I hey, could. There. I did take some medicine, so hopefully I will be be getting better as this goes on. Okay. But, but uh, hey, Amy. yeah, we got a lot of people uh, jumping in tonight. Oh yeah, we I, got a, we got a great guest tonight. I sent a lot of messages directly to people to tell them, hey, we've got this guy coming on, and he is going to tell you a story that. It's going to make you change your mind about a lot of things. Right. So um, yeah. our guest tonight is John J. Davis. He is a near-death experiencer. And uh, so let's bring him on and find out how he died and came back to life. We'll find out. Welcome, hey, John. Denise, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you just great. Thank can you, you see me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. Excellent. How are you doing, John? I am. Sometimes I'm a little tech challenged, but this, you made this really easy. So I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just click on a link and that's it. Yeah. This system is easy to use. It's great to see you all. Thanks for having me on. Well, we're excited to, oh, have, you to have you on. Yeah. Ron found, your, found a video with you speaking to someone on YouTube and he was, I was working. I sit in, this is my workspace as well. So sure. I'm sitting here, I'm listening, and I'm going, you know, this is more supernatural than paranormal, but I still think it fits into the realm of what we talk about. So um, paranormal pastor, that's Gary. So he's really interested in hearing what you've got to say. So is everybody else in the chat room. Oh, yeah. Um, my mo our mother, or his mother, my mother-in-law, Karen, and... Uh, and a whole bunch of other people. So they were all disappointed last week when we said you couldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. But they were also hoping that your son's car trouble was going to be fixed pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. So, I am sorry about that too. Sometimes weird things happen, and but I am so glad that we had a chance to meet this time. Yeah, me too. So, so how did you die? Yeah, I'll um, I'll, I'll tell you what happened is my my dad used to be in sales. And he won a sales contest one year and he won two mopeds or what we would call scooters now. And we used to ride these scooters all over the neighborhood. Well, one day I was out riding and I had an accident and I, I slammed into a tree. And the way that I landed, I tore the tendons off my right hand and I needed to go into surgery to have them reattached. Well, I was only 21 at the time and I had never really spent any time in a hospital and I, I'd never had surgery before. So I didn't know what to expect. So my mom drives me down on the day of the surgery. We go in the operating room and they started to give me the anesthesia an injectable anesthesia. And I, something happened and I had this horrific allergic reaction and it stopped my heart. And that's, that's how this whole, this whole process started. And I, I want to tell your audience, too, that normally I have a really bad memory. Like, I can't remember what I had for dinner last night. But my experience, what's so interesting to me is that I can remember every single detail of my NDE as if it happened yesterday. And that's why I have had such a, a wonderful opportunity to share my story, because I remember all the details so perfectly clearly. And even even today, it still blows my mind that I remember it so clearly. That's that's what struck me that that was different about yours. I've I've watched a, a lot of these mm -hmm. near death yeah. experiences, 
I mean, a lot of the videos and I, there's a few other people I'd, I'd like to have on a lot of, a lot of them have a uh, similar conclusions, you know, that, you know, family and friends, that's, that's our main purpose here. And, you know, to take care of that. Yeah. But, and, and, and a lot of them said that they had other gifts, you know, when they came back, you know, they, they could play a guitar all of a sudden they could sing. Or they can, or they can Some confuse. Yeah. yeah. Yours, yours was, you said, oh, I didn't have any of that. I had the gift. I, I could remember everything in detail. Now the other ones, they're not in detail like yours. The other ones they have, you know, a little fuzzy here and there, but yours, yours, you can remember everything. Yeah, it's, and it's you really think that was your gift. Yeah, I, I think you're right because I didn't, I didn't have any abilities to compose music. I, I couldn't hear angels or guides. I didn't really have anything unique, except my memory. And right. I think that's, I think that is something that they gave me. I think it was a God thing because I'm supposed to share my story, and that's always what I've done. And it's as clear to me as it was yesterday. And this happened in 1987, right? Yeah, 1987. I was 21 years old. Funny. So was I. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so. That, that's that's how it all started. And what I want to I want to tell your audience something too to kind of kind of set the stage a little bit. You know how a lot of people have what's called a kind of like a traditional near-death experience where there's some kind of an accident or they're having surgery and the person dies and they find themselves floating above their bodies looking down at the scene yep. and then they become aware of a tunnel and they start moving down this tunnel and at the end of the tunnel there's a white light and as the person's moving down the tunnel they're met by somebody a relative a friend a family member, somebody who passed before them, and they tell mm -hmm. them it's not their time and they have to go back. And so we, we've never known what happens when you go into the light. But what they did with me is my whole story starts on the other side of that white light. I don't know how they did that because I didn't go through the tunnel. I didn't see myself looking at my body. I was just, the whole beginning of my whole story starts on the other side of the white light. And I, I always, I've always wondered, how did they do that? And I, I, I probably won't know until I get to go back. But yep. that's, and, I, and I, I, look at, I look at all these different NDE stories as like jigsaw puzzle pieces. We all have these pieces of the puzzle. And I think my piece is that I can tell people what happens when they cross into the light. There's nothing to be afraid of. That's how we all get back home again. So do you, do you want me just to start telling my story? Yeah, yeah. yeah go, ahead. go right Tell ahead story. because it's interesting. Sure, and if any of you have any questions, please feel, feel free to interrupt me because I, I have a lot to share. So here's okay. what happened. So I woke up after, after my heart stopped, the, next, the very next second I opened my eyes and I was standing in the most beautiful building I have ever seen. It was made of white, white polished marble. And it was a long, long building. It was so long, I could not see the end of it. My very first thought was, and I still remember this in detail, my, thought, my first thought was, I had no idea the hospital was this big. Because I didn't know... <laughs> throughout my whole story. I didn't know that I died. So I was in this beautiful building and, and to the right of me were these white marble columns, maybe 20 or 30 feet high. They were about six feet apart and they went all the way down this corridor. Where I was standing, I was in the center of this building and there were tables, just like a kitchen table, but it was made of beautiful white marble. And again, mm. there were tables all the way down about six feet apart. And there were two people sitting at each one of these tables. Well, right about then, in my left ear, I heard, my name is Alan. I'm your spirit guide. Well, I didn't know anything about spirit guides it, when I was age 21. There was no talk about spirit guides. So I didn't know anything about this person. I was just going along this whole process. Well, what happened is my guide, Alan, was telling me everything I was seeing. 
And that's how I'm able to share with people what I saw, because he was telling me. He was telling me that I was in the orientation building. It's the first building that we all come into when we finish our lifetime. And this was the most profound part. When I looked over to my left, there were these tunnels and they looked like they'd been cut out of solid marble. They looked like doorways, just like a regular door, but it was mm -hmm. marble. And when I looked in them, it was like looking into space. And these tunnels were about six feet apart and they corresponded to the tables next to them. And these tunnels went all the way down as far as you could see. And my guide said, those are the tunnels we take from earth back to the other side, back to home again. And my guide said, look up at the next tunnel. So I looked up at this next tunnel and there was a man coming through. He was an elderly gentleman. He was probably 80 or 90 years old. And he had his right hand covering his chest like he had chest pain. And my guide said he just died from a heart attack. Well, the people that were at these tables, there were two people at these tables. My guide told me that these people are orientation counselors. And their whole job on the other side is to help people remember where they're from. For some, and I, I don't understand how this works, but whenever we come into a lifetime, most of us forget where we're from. We don't remember that the other side or heaven or the afterlife, that's, that's our real home. Earth isn't considered to be our home. We're just here temporarily to learn and to experience. So these orientation counselors, their job is to greet these people when they come through the tunnel and remind them who they really are and, what, and they're back home now. So the woman, there was a woman sitting next to, to this table or next to that tunnel. She stood up. She walked up to this gentleman and she took his hands in hers and she led him back to the table and they sat down and she was holding his hands the entire time. And I could see her mouth moving. I didn't know, I couldn't hear what she was saying because I was still too far away, but I could, I could see her talking to this man. And my guide, Alan said, watch him. So as I started to watch him and as this orientation counselor was talking to him, he began to change and he turned from a man who was 80 or 90 years old, who had lived a long life here on earth into a man in his late twenties or early thirties. <laughs> and the reason is, is we are, when we were created, that's the age that we were created at. We're all in our thirties on the other side. You can appear really any way you want to, but we're all in our thirties. And I didn't think at the time to ask my guide, why is that? Why, are, why is that the case? And it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus's life and Jesus is dying at 33, but I, I don't know. I just know that we're all young on the other side. So all of a sudden he began to change and he turned into a man in his early 30s. Well, he stood up after he went through what we call the orientation, remembering where you're from, you're back home now, you just finished your lifetime, now you're back. He stood up and he walked to the right and he walked down between these columns. He walked down three steps. Go ahead, Denise. No, I'm waving by to our, oh, get okay. one of our listeners. Yeah. Oh, that's a good yeah, question. Really yeah. So he, he walks down these three steps and he walks into what I call the gardens. I don't know if that's what the other side calls this, but they were the most beautiful meticulous gardens that I have ever seen. Beautiful green emerald colored grass with the most beautiful flowers and trees and plants that you have ever seen. It looked like an, a perfect English garden. And there were all these people there. There must have been a hundred or 200 people that were there. And the reason that they were there is that's what we call the reunion. All the people that this man had known in his lifetime that crossed before him was there. And all the people that he knew on the other side were also there to greet him when he finished his lifetime. Well, he, and I don't, I don't know if this happens anywhere else in other, other planets, but the reason that this is a big deal to come to Earth, because it's the hardest of all the planets. So when we come here, it's a really big deal. So that's why when you finish your lifetime, 
everybody is there to greet you when you get back because you did something that many, many souls don't want to do. They don't want to come to this planet because it is so hard. So that was just neat to see that there's a reunion of all the people you knew in your lifetime who are on the other side waiting for you when you get back. The other thing that I sometimes forget to tell people is that not only do all of our loved ones, everybody crosses to the other side, but so do our animals. When God created animals, he created them with souls also. And they make the transition to the other side just like we do. So any pet that you've ever had in your lifetime, they will be there when you get back. And I just thought that was that's such a wonderful thing to look forward to because I think so many of us grew up with animals, dogs or cats or all the different animals that we had, and they don't really die, just like we don't really die. Now, I want to say... We got that, one we really don't want to see yeah. when she goes. No. <laughs> She's bugging us right now. I think I, we just need to die before they do. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. But no, I wouldn't... If I really didn't like them that much, I'd have them put to sleep, but I don't. I love them. Yeah. Did they, did, did they give you any indication or say anything about the other planets? Yes. Or like how many there were? Yep. I'm going to get to that. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Yep. So that was so he, so when we pass, we go through the tunnel, we go into the light, we end up in the orientation center, we remember where we're from, and then we have the reunion. And now, what happened after that, this is when my guide started taking me to these different places. And the only thing I can think of is that, you know what it's like to be in a college campus where you have your English building, your science building, your history building, everything is in one central yep. location. Right. That's, kind of, that's kind of like where I was on the other side. Everything was in one central location, but I only saw a small part of what's on the other side. Well, what he took me to were these different buildings. And he told me, he took me to the outside of every building first so I could tell people what it looked like. And then he took me to the inside and told me what it was for. Well, the building that I was in, the orientation center, there's a building in Turkey, the country of Turkey, that your audience can go, can go Google. If you go Google the Temple of Artemis, A-R-T-E-M-I-S, it looks just like the building that I was in with the orientation center looks like this long building with white marble columns all along the outside. And that's in Turkey called the temple of Artemis. Yep. Well, now after, after this gentleman had the reunion, my guy took me to this beautiful, gorgeous Greek looking building. It was, it was rectangular building, extremely large, nothing like that. Do we have anywhere on earth? These buildings were so large and it was white marble with gorgeous white marble columns all around the perimeter. So he takes me to the inside and we go into one of these rooms and it was a round room. It looked like a round theater. And above me were all these different movie screens. Like, like when you go to see a movie, there's a big screen, but they were all in a circle over my head. There must have been maybe 15 or 20 of these, these screens. And my guide said, whenever, whenever anybody comes back from a lifetime, they all have to go through a life review. And all of a sudden, every single one of these screens lit up. And they were showing episodes of my lifetime. And every screen had a different age. Like one screen that had a, a, a movie playing of when I was a little toddler. Another screen was showing me when I was in kindergarten. Another screen was showing me when I was riding my bike to school. And the whole reason for the life review is to see if you accomplish the things that you set out to accomplish in your lifetime. The other reason we have the life review is it's a learning tool. And what I mean by that is they will show you things that you did really well in your lifetime. And they will also show you things that you could have done better. And one thing that they were playing on one of these screens, something that I never even thought was any, any big deal. But there was a, a kid in my elementary school, his name was Troy. And he had some kind of 
multiple multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's, something was wrong with his legs, and he had to walk with crutches. Well, one day we were at recess, and he fell, and a couple of us ran up to him, picked him up, helped him get his crutches back on, and, and just helped him get, get himself back together. And I never thought anything about that. Well, they were playing that on the screen because it was a selfless act on my part, and it made a big difference for him. And I never thought anything about that, but that's what's important to God. And that's what's important to the other side, that we take care of other people. That's one of the reasons that we're here. So that's one of the reasons for the life review, but they also show you the things that you did that maybe hurt other people, because that's how the soul learns. We feel what other people feel, how our actions affected somebody else. So if you lived a lifetime where you intentionally hurt other people, you still have a life review and you have to see how your actions affected other people. And that's what changes and that's what teaches a soul to learn and to go forward. So that was the life review. The next place he took me to was I really I had a hard time with because I was raised Catholic. My dad was very Catholic. We used to go to church sometimes two or three days a week and also on Sundays. So I grew up being around Catholicism. <laughs> so he takes me to another building. Again, it, it's, it's a huge, long building with white columns. He takes me to the inside and the room he took me to looked like what we call a movie theater. It's got the screen up front, this long building. And he told me, I'm going to show you past lifetimes. Well, I had never had any experience with that. Nobody ever told me that life that we have past lifetimes. I, I never was told that in religion or in church. So I had I really had a really hard time with this. But the soul, when we were created, we were created billions of years ago. And of course we have different lifetimes because God, when God created us, I think he hardwired into our soul the, the wanting to always learn and to grow. And you come into a lifetime to learn and to grow. That's one of the main purposes for coming here. So he showed me, he's gonna, he's, he started to show me past lifetimes. The first one, I was a monk in a monastery. I had a shaved head. I was wearing a red gown. And my job in that lifetime was to teach kids, little kids about becoming a monk in a monastery. And that lifetime took place somewhere in Southeast Asia. And then it disappeared. Another one showed up and it was a lifetime where I was a shoe peddler. I had a wheelbarrow and I had a bunch of shoes in this wheelbarrow. And my job in that life was to fix people's shoes. And one of the things I remember the most when I was looking at that screen of that lifetime was I was pushing this wheelbarrow on a cobblestone road. And I remember that in, in such perfect detail. And that's what I did in that lifetime. Then that screen disappeared. Did you recognize that was you? No, it, it didn't look anything like how I look okay. now because yeah. our, gen our genetics are always different in every life. Yeah. So you never look the same, but you know that you just know that that's you. That was right. you in a, in a previous life. Then he showed me a third one. And the third one is I was a fisherman and I was in a, on a lake in a little wooden boat and I was standing and I was tossing nets into the lake to catch fish. And part of my job in that lifetime was to help catch fish for the village. And that lifetime took place somewhere in the Middle East. Well, I had such a hard time believing that past lifetimes were real because how I was raised. Right. Two months after I got back from my NDE, two months had passed, I went to see a hypnotherapist because I had heard that you can actually see past lifetimes in hypnosis. Well, sure enough, I went, I went to see this woman and I actually saw three different lifetimes. And that's when I really began to believe that, oh my gosh, everything that I experienced during my NDE was real. It was true. It really was real. So that's when I got over the part about having a hard time believing that past lifetimes were real. So I, I know now that they are, and of, and of course they are, because we live forever. We never die. 
And God wanted to give us the ability to always learn and to always grow. And I'll be able to make, make the more sense of that when I get farther along with my story. Mm. So that was the past life building. The next place he took me to, again, he took me to the outside of this building. This one was different. It had a, a huge, big dome on top. It looked like the Pantheon in Rome. This big, huge dome. It was a round building absolutely gigantic and it had columns all along the circle the circumference of this building and for whatever reason and i i don't know why but that's where we go when we want to plan a lifetime and he took me in this building and he walked me up to a marble table a beautiful white marble table and there was one scroll that was folded that was rolled up with a blue ribbon around it in this scroll it looked like what I would think Egyptian papyrus paper looks like, that kind of brown coloring. And what it, what it was is when we plan a lifetime, we write on these scrolls what we want to accomplish in our lifetime. And it's, it's very detailed. It's got what country are you going to be born into? What language are you going to learn? Who are your parents going to be? All these different things. Are you going to go to a university? Are you going to have kids? What kind of career are you going to pursue? All these things go into a lifetime. So I picked up the ribbon and I, or I picked up the scroll and I took off the ribbon and I unfolded the scroll on this table. And I immediately noticed that it, it was it, the writing looked like it was calligraphy. Remember when you were a kid and you had that ink pen, and you dipped it into the ink well and you had like yeah. a little a little session on how to draw with calligraphy. That's what it looked like. And it, it has all the different segments of your lifetime. And the best way that I can explain it, it's like what a lot of us do when it, at the end of every year, when we have a, a New Year's resolution for the next year, we write out the goals we want to achieve, we want to lose weight, you want to, you know, you want to change jobs or have a different career, or whatever. And, and that becomes part of your your new year's resolution. Well, that's kind of what it's like when we write out these scrolls, we write out all the major events of our lifetime, what we want to learn and accomplish. Well, when I went to try to read what my scroll said, it folded up again and I wasn't able to read it. And I think the reason they did that was because if I had read ahead of time, what my life was going to be about, I may have done something different to prevent that outcome. So mm -hmm. we're not allowed to, really remember the things that we chose ahead of time. Well, just about then I looked over to my right and there was this huge sprawling wall and this wall was full of scrolls. There were millions and millions of these scrolls. And I learned that everybody who was on earth at that time has a scroll and all those scrolls are, are on those are on that wall. So my guide took off my scroll and put it on this table so that I could tell people that nobody is here by accident. Everybody has a reason for being here. All of us came in for a different reason. And we're all here trying to, trying to, to learn our lessons, to learn the things we wanted to learn and to experience everything we wanted to experience. And one thing I get asked a lot is, why do we actually come here? What's the reason? Well, the primary reason is that on the other side, there is no negativity. There's, there's nothing you have to work through. There's no conflict. There's nothing to, to work through because it's a perfect world. It's the, it's, a, it's the perfect place that God created for all of us in eternity. And the reason we come here is because on earth, the best way that we learn something is when you go through something difficult. If you look at your life, you think everything that you've been through has made you the person that you are today. And on the other side, we don't have that kind of opportunity because there's, there's nothing to challenge yourself with. So that's why we come here. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a little bit about the other planets because there are multiple other planets available too. In fact, that's, um, I'll jump into that right now. My guide took me to another building and this one looked like a, it looked like a sports stadium. Like you would go if you're gonna see a football game, this huge gigantic stadium. 
So then we go on the inside and there are, I remember this so, so well, there were thousands of seats in this building. It was like an auditorium and all the lights were on and it was really bright and the, the, it had a domed roof on the inside. And what it was is I was in a planetarium. Wherever, wherever my guide took me on the other side, he took me to the building that there was a planetarium there. And there was a man on, on the other side. People have jobs, kind of like, like we have jobs here, but we don't have to work to pay bills or make a living. You do what you love to do on the other side whether you like to paint or you're a writer or you like to build things, whatever you like to do, you can do on the other side. So the, there was a gentleman behind me who was in charge of the planetarium and he knew everything about the universe, galaxies, planets and suns and solar systems. That's what he loved to do on the other side. Well, he started, he spoke to me and he said, let's begin. And all of a sudden, all the lights went off. It was pitch black. I sat down and I looked up at the ceiling. And he said to me, when you look at the stars, this is what you see. And what he was referring to was that everybody on Earth at that time, back in 1987, just the lay person, this is what they know when they look at the stars. And, our, and all of a sudden, he started showing me pictures of our solar system. Our sun showed up, then Earth, then Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Mars, all of our planets in our solar system. And then it disappeared. And then he said, when we look at the stars, this is what we see. And he was talking about everybody on the other side, what they know. And all of a sudden, he started showing me planets. First, there were dozens, then hundreds, then thousands and millions of planets he started to show me. And he said to me, there is far more life in the universe than you possibly know. And I think that there were two reasons why my guide showed me this. The first one was to tell me that we're not alone in the universe. Earth is not the only inhabited planet. And the other thing he wanted to show me or to tell me was that we can have lifetimes on virtually unlimited other worlds. Earth is not the only planet. And something I want to share with your audience, something that still to this day amazes me. I used to, when I was in college, I tried to take an astronomy class because I grew up watching Star Trek. Remember the old Star Trek with Captain Kirk? Mm -hmm. I grew up watching that show and I was always just fascinated by astronomy and other planets. I always knew that there, there had to be other planets out there. Earth could not be the only one. How is that possible? So I took this astronomy class and I, I had to drop it because I could not understand the math, but I'd always loved astronomy. And I was watching a show not too long ago from this astronomer and she was trying to explain to the, to the lay person how large the galaxy and the universe really is. And she said, if, if you look at the, just the Milky Way galaxy, astronomers estimate that there are 100 billion planets just in our galaxy alone. And she said that if we had a ship that could travel at the fastest speed that we know of, which is the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, it would take 99,000 years to get from one end of the Milky Way to the other just our galaxy. And they mm. estimate that there are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. So if the Milky Way has a hundred billion planets, how many planets are in the universe? It's, it's absolutely, it floors me and it blows my mind. And one of the things I, I can't wait to do when I get back to the other side is to learn about the other planets. Cause it, it absolutely just fascinates me to no end that there are so many other worlds out there. Yeah, I, I I figured that we couldn't be the only ones. Yeah. There's just no way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely not. There are so many other worlds, so many other planets. And it was it was just so exciting for me to, to learn that when I had my experience. Mm -hmm. So that that was the planetarium. The next place he took me to was by far the largest building. And this building was 
it looks it it looked like our Supreme Court building. It had the columns in the front, but it didn't have any columns on the side. It was this long, gigantic building with with columns in the front and all these steps that led up to the front to get in. So we go on the inside and I realize it's a library and there were bookshelves probably 20 or 30 feet high. They were made of wood and there was the books, the books went down as far as you could possibly see. And my guide told me that everything you ever wanted to learn is in this library. And there were people everywhere. I saw people looking for books. Some people were studying. Some people were visiting. And the people, they look just like we do. Everybody has their own look about them. They all, they all have their own personality. Some people are taller. Some are shorter. Some have brunette hair. Some have blonde hair. It's It was just like, it was kind of like if you went to a city at lunchtime and you saw all these people, the, all these different people, that's what it looked like in this library. So wherever my guide took me to, it was a really busy place. There were people everywhere. And he took me over to, a, to the left-hand side of this library. And to the left-hand side were these rooms. And they looked like what we would call a study room in a library. All libraries have those study rooms now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it looked like. So he took me to this one, one study room. And there was, a, there was a woman sitting in this. She was sitting on a couch. And she had her back to me. She had jet black hair down to her waist. And she was wearing kind of a purplish uh, kind of a gown or a, a, a robe of some kind. And she was watching what looked like what we would call today as a flat screen TV. And it was mounted on the wall. It was this big video screen. And it looked like she was watching a movie. And my guide said, go up closer to see what she's watching. So I got closer and I could see that she was watching a battle. It was a battle that took place between Native American Indian tribes and the United States Cavalry. And I thought maybe she was watching a movie. But my guide said she was watching actual history. What this woman was doing was she was interested in learning about a particular episode of Earth's history about 200 years ago. She was watching a battle. And I said to myself, how is it possible she could be watching history because there were no there were no video cameras back then how how could this how could this be filmed and my guide said everything gets recorded and i i cannot explain how that how that happens but everything that ever happens is recorded by god and i i don't understand how that works i only know that it's real and that's how we're able to have the life review because everything in our lifetime gets recorded and we get to review it again when we get back to the other side. Well, what this girl was doing is she was just watching a battle that took place because she was interested in learning about that particular episode of Earth's history. So on the other side, we still learn. We can still learn different things. But it's not like coming to a planet like Earth where you actually have the experiential learning. And the best way that I can explain it it's like trying to explain to somebody what it's like to ride a bike for the first time. You can tell them all kinds of stories about what it's like, but they'll never really know what it's like until they do it themselves. And that's, that's why we come here, to do it ourselves and to experience. Well, that was, that was the library. And I, I just love the fact that we can go there and we can look at different episodes of Earth's history. Anything you ever wanted to learn about. And one of the things that I want to do when I get back is I have always been fascinated about D-Day, Normandy in France on D-Day. Oh, and I, yeah. I want to learn what that was like for those men, what they saw that day. And, and I know that I can do that when I go back to the other side and I can go to these viewing rooms. You can watch history. I just, I just love that part. I thought that was just extraordinary. The next place he took me to, it was a... It was a castle and a beautiful stone castle. It looked like it was made yesterday. 
absolutely beautiful and perfect. And where he took me to on the other side was a place that, again, we can come to learn. If you wanted to learn about a particular period of Earth's history, you could go to this place on the other side and you, you could see what these buildings looked like, what people lived in back in medieval Europe. So he says, let's go in. So we go inside the castle. And the first thing I notice is that there's this red carpet, beautiful red carpet all throughout the whole castle. And when you walked in, it made you feel like you were royalty. Well, on the walls, on both sides of the walls, there were these life-size paintings, beautiful life-size paintings going all the way down inside this castle. And every painting was a life-size painting of a king or a queen or somebody who had lived during that time period in medieval Europe. Well, here was the neatest thing, is that in front of every one of these pictures, there was a podium. And on this podium was a book. And what the book was, it was a, a book about that person's lifetime on earth because they had a, a public life. So if you're on the other side and you wanted to learn about medieval Europe, you could go to this place where you could see the castles, what these people lived in. You could walk in, you could see what they looked like and what they were wearing. And you could also look at this book and flip through the pages and learn about that person's lifetime. Well, right about then, I looked off to my right and there was a woman who was walking down this stairwell. You know how you know how back castles back then had those round stairwells you walked up? Mm -hmm. that, that's what she was walking down the stairwell. And she walked up to me. She had kind of strawberry blonde hair down to her shoulders. And she had kind of a peach colored robe or a gown on. And she walked up to me and she talked to me and she said, is there anything I can help you find? You know what I said to her? It's the stupidest thing I could possibly have said. I said to her, no, thanks. I'm just looking. That's, that's what you say when you go to the clothing store. You know, I, I could have asked her anything. I could have said, where am I? Who are you? I thought I was supposed to be having surgery. What, where is this place? But I, I didn't know what to say to her. Well, right about then, my guide said that what she does on the other side She's kind of like what we would call a professor. She knows everything about medieval history on earth. So if you wanted to learn about kings or queens or princesses or anything about that time period, you could go talk to her because that's what she loves to do on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just absolutely extraordinary because I love to learn. I think most of us really do like the process of learning new things. Mm -hmm. And it was great to know that on the other side, you can still learn, but you can do all kinds of things. You can, you can go hiking, you can swim, you can write, you can take classes, you can go to lectures. Everything that you like to do here on earth, you can also do on the other side. It's just an absolute beautiful, perfect place that God created for all of us. Well, here's, here's now the last part of my NDE. My guide took me to the most beautiful meadow that I have ever seen anywhere in my life here on earth. It was full of green grass. There were wildflower, every, wildflowers everywhere. And it was a perfect day. And then my guide left. The next thing that happened was a man showed up in front of me. I could see his hands. I could see he was wearing a white robe, golden sash around his waist. And he was wearing gold colored sandals that laced up his calves. And I knew immediately that this was Jesus. The being, the entity that we know that had a lifetime as Jesus here on earth, this was the man that was right in front of me. He didn't tell me that. He didn't say what his name was. I just knew that this was Jesus. And he spoke to me and he said, you must tell them there is no death. And the second he said that, boom, I was right back into my body in the operating room. And 
ever since I've had that, that NDE, I have always tried to share my story with anybody who would listen because it was the way that Jesus said that to me. He didn't say, you know what, John, when it's convenient for you, when you have time, would you please share what we showed you? It wasn't like that. He said, you must tell them there is no death. So ever, ever since that experience, I've always tried to share my story because I know that it brought me so much hope to know that nobody ever really dies. We just go back to the other side. And I, I try to share my story because I know that it brings hope to other people who have lost loved ones also. And it helps them know that there really is no such thing as death. It's just a transition back home again. And that that is my my whole story in a nutshell. Wow. Uh, who was the first person you told after mom, that experience? My and mom. What she what she think? Yeah, my mom was a lot more spiritual than I was. She was she was still Catholic, but she did a lot of reading, what we would call paranormal reading. And the only book that she knew of that would help me understand what happened was a book by Raymond Moody. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a, a near-death researcher. And he wrote a book back in 1975. It was called Life After Life. Because I, I had never heard of a near-death experience. There were, Nobody was saying, I don't think the word NDE even existed yet. No. Yeah. So the only, the only book that I had to read through was Raymond Moody's Life After Life. And when I read that, I realized that I had an experience of the other side of home. And I was given this incredible responsibility to share my story, to let people know that there really is no death and there's nothing to fear about dying. It's just how we get back home again. So what did the uh, priest in your churches and stuff think about this NDE? Oh, I, I never told anybody. I only told my mom and my, uh, my immediate family. Yeah, so I, I never, because I, I knew that they they would probably tell me that it, it was just something that I made up. Right. Something that, like a dream or some kind of hallucination. But it was it was more real than anything I have ever experienced. Now your your heart had stopped for what seven minutes? Yeah, I was I was gone for seven minutes. Yeah. Well, it's so, so weird. All this took place in seven minutes. Of time. Yeah, all of it. It's, Our it's time. Felt, yeah, it felt like I was over there for an hour or two. It felt like this this experience lasted forever, but it was only seven minutes. And they showed me all these things about the other side in that short period of time. So time on the other side is not. It's not like we measure it. It's no, different. no, it's it's a lot. Yeah, there's it's no so time on the other side. Bahamas time. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a really it's a really interesting feeling because when you're on the other side and you plan a lifetime. From their perspective, it feels like you're going to be gone for two or three months. But for us, when we get here, that two or three months could be 70, 80, or 90 years on an earth life. Mm -hmm. That's why when people pass over, when they cross, they still grieve for us because they, they miss us. But for them, they know that we're going to be back in just a couple of months. So they grieve differently than we do, where we might not see our parents for another 30 years. They're on the other side with their perspective, knowing that we're going to be back in just a, a couple of months. So a lot of a lot of the buildings you saw up there look pretty similar to some of the ones we have here on Earth, right? Ex exactly. If you if you go to Greece or go to Rome, you'll see what a lot of the buildings looked like. They looked like perfect beautiful roman architecture greek architecture and and they a lot of them had those white marble columns all along the outside absolutely beautiful i, I there's no, i've never seen anything on earth that was ever as beautiful as what i saw when i was over there these buildings are absolutely breathtakingly beautiful and i i uh 
I can't wait to get back. I know that I am here to share my story for as long as I can, but I also know that when my time comes, I cannot wait to get back. And what's interesting too is when you, when a person dies, it feels like stepping out of your car or taking off your jacket. That's what it feels like. It's such a simple process, the actual, the actual process of dying. It's just so easy and everybody does it. We've all done it many, many times before and it's how we get back home again. So who do you want to see in concert when you get back? You know who I want to, you know who I actually want to see very much. I want to meet, I want to meet Bruce Lee. Oh. I have all, all of my life. I've always loved martial arts and I'm hoping that when I, when my time comes that, He'll still be there and I'll have a chance to meet him and maybe even train with him in martial arts. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question here from Amy Vince. Does it matter how a person dies? Not that I saw. Not that I saw. Everybody goes to the other side. And I was shown that everybody has a life review. Everybody has to go through that. But it doesn't matter how you pass. And what's interesting to me is when I looked at that, when I looked at my chart, I think I would have liked to have seen the details that go into it. I, I, because I couldn't read it, I couldn't see how much detail, but I know that all the main elements of our lifetime is planned ahead of time. And that includes how we're going to pass. All of us are only here on a temporary assignment. We all have to die to get back home again. And that's a, that's a big part of a person's chart. Are they going to live a long life? Are they going to live a short life? It's totally up to the individual soul in terms of what they wanted to learn. Not everybody comes here to live a long life. Some people might choose to exit at 30 because they would have learned everything they wanted to learn. And other times, children come in, not necessarily for themselves, but they come in to teach other people. And so they pass at a, at a very early age. Every soul has a unique reason for being here. And every one of us has a purpose. And something that I could share with you and your audience is that we don't, we don't realize how much support we actually have on the other side. There are people that are rooting for us, that, are, are, that, that there is so much support on the other side that we just don't even realize it. And that's when I when I saw that reunion of that band that I saw, the elderly gentleman come through the tunnel. That's when I realized that we really have so many people on the other side that are there supporting us, that are want us to, to do what we came here to do, to learn and to make a difference with our lives. Because the only thing we take with us is what we learned. None of the material things that, we all, we all are, are raised to think makes you successful. Things, possessions, property, all these things that we think are, are success. None of that goes with us. And the other side doesn't care about any of that. That's the only terrible. thing they, the only thing they care about is did you, did you learn what you came to learn? And did you try to make a difference and help other people along the way? So uh, any, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying is you was on the other side of the light, what everybody ever says, right? Yes. Yep. So the ones that don't go to the light, they're still, their spirits are still here on earth. Yeah. There's, I, I, I wasn't told this by my guide, but I have read that, you don't have to go into the light. Nothing is nothing is forcing you to. And I, I think that's where the idea of earthbounds come from or the idea of a ghost. But at, at some point, everybody will cross into the light. And I, I don't really understand why a soul wouldn't want to cross into the light. Because the one thing that I felt so strongly when I was having my NDE was that on the other side, you can feel God. You can feel 
how much this being loves and cherishes every single one of us. It's the most extraordinary thing that I have ever felt in my life. And we don't feel that here on earth. And I, and I don't know why. Earth is kind of like the opposite. When you come to an earth life, it's almost like you're in a battle or a war and you're in a mm -hmm. foxhole without a radio. You feel like you're cut off. That's what it feels like. And that's when I when I had when I came back from my NDE, I went through a horrible, horrible depression because I did not want to be here anymore. I wanted to be back there again. I don't I didn't want to stay here. How was I supposed to live my life when I was 21 years old, knowing what the other side is like, knowing how wonderful and how beautiful and how much joy and peace and love is there? And I the only thing that helped me was was what Jesus told me when he said, you must tell them there is no death. And that's when I realized that, okay, they gave me this assignment that I'm supposed to share. And that's kind of what pulled me out of that depression was the, uh, the ability to share my story and to give people hope that they may not have had before. I thought that was interesting uh, when you said that you, you, kind of, you kind of pick your life how long you wanted to, to be on earth you yeah. get to pick your parents yeah yeah there you go mom dad exactly I you, so you know yeah. <laughs> but how do you know what to That's write why down for your next life what you want to do how would you know that i don't know i don't know i, I think you would maybe write down things that you want to learn do you feel like you want to learn more about compassion or do you want to learn about understanding do you want to learn about loss because on earth, it's the only place where you ever lose somebody. On the other side, nobody ever dies. That's our permanent state. So we all, we all come here to learn different things, to learn maybe about what it's like to, to have loss in your life. Maybe you want to experience what it's like to, to lose your parents or to have a job loss or to, I mean, any number of things people come here for. But it's it's all just for the sake of learning. Pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, it, it's crazy. First thing that pops in my mind when you're saying that is, who was it the scrolls when they wrote down? Well, I'm going to go back and be a serial killer. I don't know. I I've wondered that myself too. Yeah, I, I don't you know, know. That's kind of strange to say, but. Oh, I know. I, I have I have thought that before and I and I don't have an explanation for it. I, I don't understand. And I, I've heard people say that people come in with the idea to murder somebody because that person wanted to experience that. And I, I don't know if that's true. I didn't see that. My guy didn't tell me anything about that. All I know is that we all have scrolls. And I also know that God created us with free will. All of us right. have free will. And when you plan a lifetime, everybody has goals, but nothing is really, nobody holds a gun to your head and says, this is what you have to do. It's, it's when you get here, the major elements of your lifetime are going to happen. Like what country are you going to live in? What language are you going to learn? who your parents going to be, all those major elements of your lifetime are going to happen. But every other thing that happens, there are, there are infinite things that can happen, all different types of possibilities. And we can't plan for every single contingency. We just all try to do our best while we're here. Did you know your spirit guy? You said his name was Alan. Did you yeah, know I, no, I had never no. even I had never even heard of spirit guides. I have I've heard of angels because we were always talk, told about that in in church. Right. I, but I had I had never known that we have spirit guides and and all of us have guides. They help us plan our lifetime. They help us choose the experiences that we're going to have to help us learn what it is we want to learn about. And they're with us yeah. during our they're with us during our entire lifetime. Yeah, a lot of people that say, "Well, I had this this gut feeling that I should have done whatever." Right. Yeah. But I think that's maybe the spirit guides kind of nudging us that way. I, I think so too. I, I think that's how they communicate with us is through dreams. 
I'll tell you a dream that I had about eight years ago when my wife's dad died. About three days after he died, I had a dream about him. He came to me in a dream and he spoke to me and he, he said, everything is going to be all right. We're all going to be together again. There are no accidents. And then he said, give it everything you've got. And please tell my family I'm okay. And I wrote it down. I woke up and I told my wife, I just, I just had a dream, a dream about your dad. And so I wrote everything down so I would remember it. And that's, that has been one of the most extraordinary things I've ever had happen was to have that dream. And he said, give it everything you've got. So when you're here in life, do your absolute best. Learn everything you can because that's what you take with you when you leave. Well, like Tom says here, what if someone takes their own life? Suicide. Yeah, they, they take into healing centers on the other side. Nobody Nobody's punished. There is no hell. God doesn't send anybody from into hell. Suicides, nobody wants them to take their lives. The other side wants them to finish their lifetime and complete what they came here to learn. But nothing, nothing happens to them when they cross over. They're given the support, the love, the kindness, and the care because they, they really got lost along the way and they lost themselves. And they, they believe that the only way to stop the pain is to take their life. And I'm very familiar with this because I lost one of my cousins to suicide and I lost one of my best friends to suicide. And it's, it's horribly hard for the people that are left behind. Yeah, it and is. they, when they get to the other side, they have to be counseled because they have so much guilt when they get back. Cause nobody, nobody plans to take their lives. It's not part of a person's chart. It's nobody ever plans that at the age of 25, I'm going to take my life. That's, that's not what happens. No, no one's chart has the experience of suicide. Makes sense. Yeah. No, how about my wife? Denise says, how about murder? Yeah. People commit murders. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> I, I have heard my, my guy didn't mention anything about that. And I know that, on earth, horrible things happen here. And I I think this is a very dark world and things do happen. And I, I don't know if a person chooses on the other side to murder somebody. That I don't know. Right. All I know is that because we were given free will, we have the option to choose a path of light or a path of darkness. And there are souls who have chosen to turn their back on God. And I don't understand why. I, I don't know if that's anything to do with Satan or if there really was a fall. In, in Catholic teaching, we're told that there was a fall, a fallen angel named Satan. Yeah. Who took a lot of, a lot of angels with him. And that earth is, is their hell. It is, it is their world. And I, I don't know because I my guy didn't mention anything about that. Yeah. But I all you have to do is turn on the news every day to know that there is darkness here. It does really exist. And all all of us are fighting against that. But I, I don't understand if people come in with the with the express purpose of harming other people. I just don't know. Yeah. Have you ever seen Alan again? No, I never have. Okay. I've never, I've never talked. I mean, I, I talk to him all the time, especially when I drive my car, but I, I never hear him. I know he's there because I know, right. I know our guides are with us all the time. And something else I can tell you is that everybody on the other side, they can hear us if we talk to them. So if you, if you've lost your parents or you lost friends or relatives, you can talk to them and they can hear us. What I don't know is if they can hear us when we pray. I know God can, but I, I don't know if our loved ones can hear prayers. 
but they can hear us when we talk out loud to them. Here's a good question from Pastor Gary, the paranormal pastor. How long after your experience was it before you started sharing with others? It was actually probably within a couple of months. And I didn't have a, a large audience. I would just tell people that I worked with, friends, acquaintances. I just always tried to bring it up because I felt it was so important. And, and especially when I heard of friends who had lost their parents or their grandparents or loved ones. I would always try to, to share my story that way. And it wasn't until 2019 that I got the idea that, why don't I just put this on Facebook? And maybe, maybe I can reach more people that way. And that's how it started. And then I started getting people emailing me, asking me if I would come on their podcast and share my story. And I, and I I love to do it. I love to share my story. Anytime I have the opportunity, I am just, I'm so blessed that I have the ability to bring people the hope in the knowing that death is not the end, that it's an absolute requirement for life and how we get back to the other side again. We all have right. to go through it. That's how we get back home. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Have you written a book yet? You know what? I haven't, but I've actually thought about it. I have had so many people tell me that, that, that writing a book could actually actually reach a lot more people. So it's something that's kind of on my radar, but I haven't, I haven't started it yet. Yeah, I remember hearing this story on YouTube, but it was a graphic story. With oh, yeah. Picture. Yeah, did you create that? No, I had nothing to do with it. A lot, a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the podcasts I've been on, they have their own, their own editors, their own graphic artists, and they, they make these pictures and they really make it come to life. It's really cool how they do that. But I, right. I have, I have no, um, I have no input on any of that. Okay. Yeah. What'd you ask me? the people on the other side. oh did you uh denise wants to know if, uh, did you see any people from the other planets what they know like? I, I i don't know everybody i saw looked just like we do and okay. I, I i can't help but think that other alien civilizations they all have their own their own evolution so i'm sure they must look different than we do and yeah I, I think of it just like i think of star trek or star wars that other planets have their own species and they they've all evolved just like we did. But everybody I saw on the other side, they, they look just like we do. But I did see every race, every ethnicity is represented there. Everybody has their own unique look, how they like to appear. But that's, I have been asked that before. And, and even when I was in that planetarium, did I, did I see any kind of civilizations on these different planets? But the perspective that they gave me, it was like being in orbit. I was too high to be able to see anything about what the civilizations looked like. I only knew that all, every one of these planets had civilizations. They had species. And we have lifetimes, if we want to, on those worlds also. That Earth is not the only place we can come for a lifetime. Right. Yeah. Pastor Gary wants to know, what work do you do today? My wife and I, we have a little transcription business, do medical transcription. Mm -hmm. But mostly what I, I, I pretty much, I guess I'm kind of retired because I, I try to do this most, most of my time. I, I do this full time, just share my story. Okay, here's a question from Ed O'Dell. Did you by chance get a feel or perhaps their lifespans? Of, of our vary? life? All I, all I know about that is all of us choose when we're going to pass. And some of us choose to have long lifetimes into our 80s or 90s. And some of us choose to go much earlier than that. And I can tell you a story about that. My wife 
had a friend when she was growing up. Her name was Julie. And it was her best friend. They spent years and years together. And Julie had always told her mother that she wasn't going to be here past the age of 18. And she would always say, oh, Julie, don't be ridiculous. You're going to live a long life. And she would always tell her parents that, no, mom, I'm not supposed to be here past age 18. Hmm. Well, when she turned 18, about six months later, she was killed in a car crash. So I, I know that all of us come here for different reasons. And we come here to live different lifetimes, different lifespans. Some of us can learn what we want to learn. And then we go home at a young age. And some of us want to stay here and have long lifetimes because we want to learn different things. It's strictly up to the soul. And the one thing I learned too about that is nobody tells us or forces us to come into a lifetime. It's totally up to us. There are many, many souls on the other side who don't want to come to earth because it is so hard. They choose to go to other planets, other worlds for lifetimes because this one really is the hardest earth is the hardest of all the planets that's interesting yeah isn't it it is i, I believe it <laughs> yeah it's not easy no it's not it's, it's a, not easy the challenge every day yep it is every like every said, single we always hear the story of people trying to go through the light on this side yeah mm -hmm. you're not the only story i've ever heard of what's after the light. Yeah, that's that's why I wanted him on here. Right, I know that's, right. I know that's and it's I, I I always think of it as being a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, that we're all trying to put these pieces together, and the biggest piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I got was that part about what's on the other side of that white light, what is actually there, and that's how that's the very first step we make when we go back home again, at the end of our when our lifetime is finished, we end up in the orientation center. Well, if you're in the orientation center and you was there and you seen the one guy holding his chest that yeah. had a heart attack, what about the other two million people that die every minute? Yeah, the, the, well, they was, went through the light or not passing through the light or I, I don't what? know. There, all I all I know is that it was it was very, very busy where I was. All these people were talking to other people that had passed over. And the one thing I don't understand, and I, I still don't understand to this day, is those people who were called the orientation counselors, all of them, are they're, they, they're at these tables, corresponded to a tunnel. And when we finish our lifetime on earth and we come through these tunnels, I don't understand how they know who's coming through, but they do. There were no computers on these tables. There were no papers. I don't understand how they know who's going to come through and when, but they do. And all I can think of is it's a God thing. It's just something that we can't comprehend unless you're on the other side, right. but they know, they know who's coming through. They know when that person's lifetime is going to be finished they know when they're going to be coming through the tunnel. Something else, too, that I want to tell your audience is that the other side always sends somebody to get us. Nobody ever dies alone. The other side always sends somebody. And usually it's somebody that you know, grandparents, parents, a spouse, somebody that you know, they always send someone to get us. And I thought that was just absolutely beautiful. Because so many people are afraid to die. And when you see somebody that who's passed before you, you know that, okay, I'm going to be all right. There really is life after death. Now, when you, you saw Jesus, that, I presume that was, that was pretty short. Or it was very, it, it was very, it was very short. Very short. Yep. But uh, everybody's got an interpretation here on earth. What he you know, different pictures or drawings of what he looked like. How, how close was it? I could not see his face. Oh, you couldn't here, see his here, face? Here's the, was so interesting. I could see his body. Yeah. When I went to look at his face, there was so much light that was, was coming, 
yeah, there was exactly there was it looked like it looked like lightning coming out of him. There was so much light, I could not see what he looked like. He was different hmm. than the other people that I saw. Right. Everybody, everybody else I saw looks just like you do. We all, we all look our unique look, but him, he was different because there was so much light coming from his face, so much energy. I, I couldn't make out any of his features. Hmm. Do you know anyone else that's uh, had the experience that you did? That you know after the tunnel. No, no, I've I've never. I've never come across anybody that ever had the kind of detail that I had. Right. Right. There was a, there's a woman that I've heard about that she was in Afghanistan and her during the Afghanistan war, she, her Humvee was hit by a, a rocket, a rocket propelled grenade mm -hmm. and she died and she had an experience where she met her guide where her guide told her that you have the option of coming back home or you can stay where you are and share this experience that you had knowing that life doesn't end. And she knew that she had to come back because she had kids, but I don't remember what her name was. Okay. Pastor Gary asked another question. <laughs> Did you know the person that came to get you there at the no, hospital? Nobody actually did. When when I died and I woke up, I was standing in that room in that building. So my my experience wasn't like that. I didn't go down the tunnel. I didn't have someone come to get me. They just they just were able to move me somehow to the other side on the other side of that white light. And I, I don't know how they did that. Maybe we don't all have to go through the tunnel. I don't I don't know. But they Maybe just not. wanted me, they just wanted me to tell people that. There's nothing to be afraid of when you see that light. That that light is what calls us home. Do the doctors or nurses or the hospital tell your parents, hey, we lost this guy for about seven minutes? Or did you No, I I, I told them. I told my mom okay. and dad. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't think they want to probably admit that but yeah i'm, I'm sure they know. didn't I'm, I'm sure they were probably probably very very shocked that that happened oh yeah yeah i'm sure they don't expect that to happen when people have some kind of an allergic allergic reaction yeah although it's it's happened i mean you know somebody they call it minor surgery but it's you know it's only minor if it's somebody else yeah exactly yeah when you did come to and everything did the doctors or nurses notice anything about you why the, that seven minutes not really no cool? i remember i remember i asked i asked them i said what just happened because I, I was trying to see if they understood what i had just experienced and they didn't mm. that's the doctor said that we lost you and i said well how long because it felt like i was gone for an hour and that's when he told me that i was gone for seven minutes just crazy, huh? Yeah. Wow. It is. Because that's a long time to be dead and then come back. To yeah. Life. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It is a long time. Yeah. So they had to be working hard on you to get you to come back. Yeah. Yep. But like you said, you had a reaction to the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like yep. me when I was two years old, I went in to have my tonsils taken out and my aneroids taken out. Oh, yeah. And the doctor gave me, because of my O negative blood type, that mom and dad's blood don't mix on boys. Oh, right? right. And everything. So the doctor at the time said, we're going to give him an anesthesia shot and everything to see if it just knocks him out for about 30 minutes, right? An hour later, I'm still not woke up. Oh, My mom wow. and my older sister have each have an arm of me trying to drag me and get me to walk up and down the halls until I woke up. Oh, really? And they well, went, well, we can't give him that big a dose. Yeah, you had a reaction too. Mm-hmm. Especially as a little guy like that. 
That's yeah. right. Well, just like Pastor Gary said, my pastor and everything, his wife passed away. So when he had his major, he had a, a widow maker heart attack. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And like he said, he told the Lord that my daughters did not need to go through just after their mother had died. And stuff. Oh, yeah. And I mean, he had a widow maker out in his driveway. Yeah. And he don't remember crawling up on his deck into his house and calling 911 when they found him. Oh, really? Oh, wow. yeah. And stuff. And because he had that, they got him in the ambulance and they said, okay, we're going to take you to Cameron Hospital, which nobody wants to go to Cameron Hospital because it's a first aid bandage station. Yeah. It's basically what it is. He goes, take me to Liberty the big hospital where they work on your heart and everything right Mm -hmm. up here where we live at. And they said, well, if you start having another heart attack, we have to, by law, stop at Cameron to get you stabilized. All the time he was in the ambulance, his heart was fine. He gets to Liberty hospital. They get him into the ER. He has another massive heart attack. Oh my gosh. Yeah, wow. but he came out of everything real good. Yeah, you're oh, dead. Good. Yeah, it's what twenty miles between those Cameron and the. Uh... It was twenty miles to Cameron, and then yep. another twenty-five to Liberty. Yeah, and stuff. So forty-five, say forty-five minutes to an hour. He was in that ambulance and everything, wow. and didn't have no heart issues or anything. And they get him down there and said, well, we think he was having a heart attack when we found him. But, you know, everything's cleared up. Then he had another major heart attack. He said, yeah, he had one. It must have been someone was looking out for him, it sounds like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would say his wife was looking out for him because she had just passed just oh, a little yeah. while before that. She died of COVID and everything. Oh. And, uh, yeah. It was rough. Yeah. yeah. We lost a lot of good people from that. Mm-hmm. We did. We lost a lot of good people. So. Well, gentlemen, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta go. I got to go feed my dogs. That's okay. I was going to say. I think okay. We're our- well, John, we want to thank you for coming on here and sharing that story. Well, I so yeah. I so enjoyed it. I, I want to thank you all for having me on. And if any of your audience has any questions for me, I want to give you my email. That's okay. the, that's the okay. best way to reach me. And my email is John J Davis 65 at iCloud.com. Okay. If you have any questions for me or people want to just talk or chat, they're more than welcome to email me. I get back to everybody. Takes me a little bit of time, but I get back to everybody. (laughs) Well, we got a lot of people over here in the chat room that I know do podcasts. So you may be getting invited for some more Uh, podcasts. I would be happy to get that. I'd be happy to share my story. Anytime I can, I I'm always I'm always happy to do so. Right. Yeah, I like that. I I watched your video on I've I've seen a lot of these and you know, near death experiences. And I said there's this there's something different on this one. I said, in fact, there's a lot of different. There is. You can remember everything in detail. And it was like beyond past that, that light there. Yeah. Right. And as soon as, as soon as I got through watching it, my wife goes, we need to get him on a show. And I said, I was thinking the same thing, but I said, I said, I don't know if we could. I said, well, we'll, we'll try. Oh, I'm, and, I'm so and, I'm so glad you Denise, answered back right away, and I went all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that Denise reached out to me. Yeah, I so this great. this is going to be a good one. It's well, we'll thank, let you thank go. You all. Thank you all for your So again, it's we like want to thank you. Great to meet you both. Tell Denise, right. like, nice. <laughs> yeah, to meet she's you got too. a migraine. She said sorry about that, but. She kind of woke up with one that hadn't gotten any better. Yeah, right. That's terrible. Yeah, those migraines are horrible. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you again. Okay. Nice to meet All you. All right, today. John. Thank have you. A good, right. you. Have a good night, John. Right. Good night. Bye-bye now. So, 
That was an interesting story. I told you. I told you. I mean, There's... I was expecting some backlash in the chat room there a little bit and nothing there. You know. Yeah, like, like I say, he's, you know, as a matter of fact, I mean, he just tells you what he saw. And when, when he started his story and said he was in there for the uh, the scooter wreck that his dad had won, I went, Yeah. Oh, I've heard this story on YouTube. Yep. And stuff with the graphics of everything he described they had in a picture they developed. Oh, yeah. On there. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah, I so, mean, they can add graphics. You know, there's some people, I mean, you could describe what you, you know, something that you saw and, and they could they could do it. Just, you know, like uh, the for the, you know, the police. Oh, uh, yeah. What do they call them? Well, uh, what? they can do it through right. AI now and everything. Yep, Suze, you need to watch it. On yeah, Suze, you need to watch that. And and if, if he'll have it. He's got his email at the end. If if you want to ask him any you know specific questions, he'll he will answer. John J. Davis. John J. Davis. Sixty five yeah. at iCloud.com. Sixty five at iCloud.com. Right. I know. I anybody that wants him on their podcast, contact him on that email. He'll be glad to come tell your story, because all listeners will. Everybody has their own opinion of what happens when you die, right? So this opens up another avenue to look into, you know, and see. Yeah. Well, like I said before, I, there's, I guess that explains a lot of, I mean, they talked about past lives, but there's, there's, there's certain things that I know that I I really shouldn't know, but I yeah. actually know it as a matter of fact. And I and it's something about, you know, it could be a subject that I never even studied before. Or I, I shouldn't know it, but I do. And I, I, I can't explain that. Exactly. I mean, there's a lot of things unexplainable that we do through our lifetime. Yep. And everything. But just like I asked him in there. Who's going to sign on that paper for their next life to be a serial killer, a mass right. murderer? Well, as I said, you, he's you off, know, you just he's off the show, we'll put it like this. Who would sign down there that they want to be the old Biden? Yeah. Who would want to do that? Free will. That's free will, I guess. You know, I guess that's, that's called free will, so guarantee they wouldn't like to come back it would be bad i mean yeah I, yeah but yeah part, you're right i mean you're not signing up to be a serial killer nobody no. is going to actually do that but you know the only part that around. i disagreed with him on is when he said there's no hell yeah there's a hell there's evil they may not have showed him that's 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 what i'm thinking that's what I'm thinking. They didn't show him everything. I mean, but what they showed him was was quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a lot. Right. And I, I you mean, know, if you think about it, I, I don't think they would. You know, they I don't think they would show you there is a hell. No. That's I mean, why you probably don't have people signing up to be a serial killer or a mass murderer. They're probably going right. somewhere else. Right. In yeah. a different direction. The only question I didn't get to ask him and I thought about it was, okay, if you sign down on that paper, what's your next life's going to be? Mm -hmm. How long before you go to it? That's up to you, I guess. Once you get back home is what he called it. Okay. That's you're picking your you. mom and dad. and all, How do you know who to pick? Well, evidently I knew what I was doing. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I, guess I didn't <laughs> when I picked mine. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, growing up, little kids <laughs> and everything, you're like, well, I wish I had those parents. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's that's true. What Gary said, anyone that went to hell wouldn't be where he was at. So exactly. that's what I'm saying. I didn't show. I don't 
they just didn't show him that. I no. think. No. And I don't I don't think there would be a reason to, really. No. It, it makes sense. I mean, what the stuff that he saw was I you know, that he experienced or they gave him, I, I think is really important information. It is for what his spirit guide led him through to show him and tell right. him what to look at and everything. And then at the very end to end up in this beautiful pasture field with Jesus Christ in front of you and everything. And like, mm-hmm. like I said, when you asked, what do you look like? No, you're not going to see him because yep. his glowing face, you know, we're all in the image of God. So, yeah. It's, it was quite the story. I mean, we had great, I told you. Told we you had that. great listeners. A lot of people came in to listen to it. Yeah. Tonight. Crystal says, I don't believe it's a choice for us. I kind of, I kind of go with crystals there. I think they already have it picked out for us. You just might initial it. That you accept it, I, you know. Oh, what you want to, yeah, what you want to experience or what you want to learn. Are you sending me a message or are you sending Denise and Ron a message? What? From Raw Side Paranormal. That's Laura. That's Julie. I know, that's Laura. Or Julie sent, yeah. Oh, sending it to Julie. Yeah, send it to Julie. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing mumbling in the back here. I'm... It's Denise. We hear, that. we hear that when we're on investigations, the mumbling yeah. in the background. But yeah, I know Denise has got a major migraine. I could tell when she first got on here before the show started. Yeah, or she even said anything that she was not feeling good at all. She laid down for a couple hours. And I haven't seen her. her. I, I haven't her seen her have one of these bad migraines in a long time. Yeah, it's it's been a while. So I want to thank everybody in the chat room for joining us tonight and everything. I mean, it was a fantastic show. Mm-hmm. Share it out everywhere and stuff so he can get that story out. But uh, we want to thank Temple of Phoenix Rising Entertainment's Facebook page, Things Network Facebook page. Of course, here at the Bill of Rights Network, we're all live on those. And we're also live on uh, Denise Pride and Moore's page, the Paranormal Pride, uh, the Paranormal Pride on YouTube. And we're also live over on Born TV on Rumble. So you can always find our shows on any of those pages. Yep, right. Gary, the kids in South Carolina do have water and electricity. They just got their electricity back on yesterday. Yesterday morning. Good. Yeah, good. Or Saturday, Saturday afternoon, maybe. Right. And your daughter and son-in-law got their garage taken care of or getting it taken mm, care of not yet i don't think anyone's come out to look at that yeah you know, the roof caved in above the garage but from all this they did learn how to use a uh, grill outside oh well, good a barbecue grill yep hey easiest thing to use Especially i know if everything goes out you gotta learn to barbecue yep there's some way of always start well, a fire yeah. and stick a hot dog on a stick. When they're they're saying you could be no electricity for over a week, you know, everything's Ooh. gonna go bad. So I said you need to get it out of the freezer and refrigerator, go ahead and cook it on the grill. Yeah. All these electric companies are sending their guys yeah. down there to work. I don't know if my buddy Scott, the one I deer hunt with, I haven't heard from him. It, he he signed up for it after he retired. They wanted him to go down, do different things. So I don't right. know if he went down there or not. Yeah, my cousin's kid, his Noah, 
came down from Jeff City. He's down. Well, he was in Florida. I don't know. I don't know if he's moved anywhere else from there. But my cousin saw him up in the up in the boom and gave him some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all our prayers have got to be for everybody over there in Georgia, yeah. the Carolinas, Tennessee, all up and down, down in Florida for what's going on because our government's slow on helping people in this. Well, country. this government. Yeah. This, this government. particular administration sucks. It, it does. And every agency with it. Yeah. It's got to so, go. But I think we're going to end this show. And everything I got to get ready for the next show, the conservative view. We're going to be discussing and showing the vice presidential debate on there tonight. So, everybody, join us here on the Bill of Rights Network, and we'll see you next week here on the Paranormal Nation Radio, Not So Normal. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>